Today we will move on to the last major type of stress, which is bearing stress. Now if two bodies are pressed against each other, compressive forces are developed on the area of contact. This is why we refer to bearing stress as contact pressure. By the way, if you hear the word pressure, it's just the same as stress. Now it's important to note that bearing stress differs from compressive stress because it is an internal stress caused solely by compressive forces. Now bearing stress is denoted by sigma b which is equal to the bearing force divided by the bearing area. This is essentially still just force divided by the area. But we are adding the subscript b to signify bearing. And so now, let's go to the basic definition of bearing stress. Let's say we have two bodies in contact with each other. Now if this top cube is placed against the bottom cube, there will be an internal stress at the junction point of these two objects. And so if we isolate the top cube, and project lines over the edges, the area enclosed by those points is what we call the bearing area because that's the area in contact with another body. Now usually in strength of materials, we are interested in the bearing stress in bolt connections which usually look like this and so as an illustration of bearing stress in these connections, consider the lap joint formed by the two plates that are riveted together as shown. Now this is our rivet and it connects the two plates now notice here that this bolt is in contact with the plates because this is placed against the plate and so if you apply the force P, this bolt will develop an internal stress due to the contact pressure. Now if you think of it conceptually, the stress caused by the rivet is not constant. It actually varies from zero at the sides of the hole to a maximum behind the rivet. By the way, this is still the top view of our system and so I will just show you later how the bearing stress is not constant. Now let's look at our plate from the side. We will have this figure. Now let's just remove our bolt heads so that we can make sense of the bearing area. Now in the isometric view of our connection, we'll be able to better understand how we can project an area. And so we have this one, but in order to draw the free body diagram, let's actually isolate one plate and so let's move this out of the way and we'll try to analyze only the top part. Now this is our free body diagram, we have our applied force right here, and then to maintain equilibrium, there will be a resisting force, which is our bearing force. Now from this FBD, we see that the bearing force PB is just equal to the applied load. Now as I mentioned earlier, the bearing stress caused by the rivet is not constant. It varies from zero at the sides of the hole to a maximum behind the rivet, as shown right here. However. The difficulty inherent in such a complicated stress distribution is avoided by the common practice of assuming that the bearing stress, sigma b, is uniformly distributed over a reduced area and so let's actually transmit this to the side of the plate. Now the reduced area here that we will consider is the projected area of the rivet. Now let's draw a line from the sides of the bolt and then let's draw two vertical lines which are parallel to the height of the bolt. And so we have this. Now this green area is the projected area of the rivet where this dimension is the thickness of the plate and then this other dimension is just the diameter of the rivet. And so what we are assuming here is that the bearing force acts over this area and so this will be the area that we will take into account. Again, this area is a reduced area so it is a smaller area than the actual bearing area which means that using this area in design is more conservative. Effectively, this will increase the value of the safe load which provides a safer design. Now to better understand this area, let's make a cut right here and then let's isolate that section. And so we'll have this figure, this is our diameter, and this is our thickness. And then we'll just consider the pink area. Now, bearing failure is the failure which occurs in the plate when the applied load crosses the elastic limit. Now we have this figure, uh, this is our initial figure. Once this plate is tested, this is how bearing failure would look like. Now bearing failure may also occur in rivets and this happens when the strong plates in bearing carrying heavier stresses press the rivet. The rivet is crushed around the half circumference and this would be the bearing failure of rivets. Now generally, if the connected plates are made of high strength steel, then failure of bolt can take place by bearing of the plates on the bolts. If the plate material however is weaker than the bolt material, then failure will occur by bearing of the bolt on the plate and the hole will elongate. So basically, failure depends on which material is weaker.
Now, in reinforced concrete design, bearing stress in footings refers to the stress applied to the soil underneath a footing or a foundation. Now, when the structure is built, its weight is transmitted through the footings to the soil below, and then our bearing stress here is the force per unit area exerted by the footing on the soil. And then this contact area can vary depending on the shape and size of the footing. Because in some cases, we can have circular footings, combined footings, rectangular footings, square footings, or the like. There are a lot of cases. And so let's say we have this footing, and then we have a downward concentrated load P, which is applied at the column. Now this load just comes from the loads transmitted to the column from our beams and girders, because essentially, our girders are supported by columns, and then our columns are supported by the footing. But then, what supports the footing? It's actually the soil below. And so if we are to draw the FBD, the soil will have a resulting distributed reaction right here. However, we have to note that this is a bearing stress. And so this is actually applied over the area. As such, if you look at our figure in 3D, we could see the reaction of the soil, which will look like this. And then our projected contact area, which is this one, is basically the area of the footing. Now why do we have to increase the area of the footing in our structures? Imagine that you have a stick, and let's say we're building a structure on sand. When you push the stick into the sand, it easily penetrates because the force you're applying is concentrated over a small area, which is the tip of the stick. So even a small force could create a large pressure exceeding the sand's bearing capacity. This causes the sand to fail locally, and the stick would sink in. Now place a flat object like a wide plate or board on the sand and apply the same force. In this case, the load is distributed over a much larger area, reducing the pressure on the sand under the plate. So now, the pressure would be lower and likely below the sand's bearing capacity. The sand can now support the load without failing or excessive settlement, so the plate will remain stable. And so this is basically why we have what we call bearing plates and also the reason why footings and foundations are built over a large surface area. And so this is the summary of all the things you should know related to bearing stress. In our next videos, I will provide more example problems so that you will be able to apply the concepts in more advanced subjects. Now just an additional input, when our column loads are very large, it will have the tendency to punch the footing. And so in your future subjects, you will be able to know that this is subjected to punching shear. But since we are still in mechanics, we will not be dealing with those. But this is just a simple orientation, and so I hope in your future subjects, you will be able to apply the concept that we have learned here, because our subjects in civil engineering are interconnected, and then strength of materials or mechanics of deformable bodies is one of the core foundational subjects.